inflation, which people expect to fall off a cliff, doesn't fall off a cliff as fast or as meaningfully as people want. And so I will explain inflation as three different chapters, and we've seen the first two chapters play out. So 2021, chapter one, was all about energy inflation. And, you know, we all talked about having almost $10 gas at the pump and what does it mean for everybody? And it caused that initial spike in inflation. And then we had it come off and Sachs called this. He said, you know, we're going to have this sort of double hump. And 2022 was really the story of goods inflation, right? All these prices and all of these things went up because the input costs went up and we all had to bear the implications of that. But then that started to ebb. And now, if you looked at the tail end of 2022, what I found super interesting was the number of articles I saw about wage inflation, whether that was Biden using an 1800s era law to prevent a railroad strike, the number of states that increased minimum wage, the trend around unionization. So in general, my thought is that the pendulum is swinging very markedly away from capital and towards labor. And as the labor participation rate stays low and continues to go down, and also it's compounded by an unemployment rate that may go up, right? People are, it's gonna be harder and harder to get people to do the work you need at the company you have unless you pay them more. And if that gets exaggerated, then inflation will stay where it is. It won't be as muted and it won't fall off a cliff as people want. It'll be so persistent. That's my, that's my big contrarian Got it. wager for this year is that we that see is inflation. That is quite contrarian. We see wage inflation that keeps inflation not going down as much as people want. Here's what I think is going to happen this year. My, my big prediction is based on, um, I think the world has too much debt. I think that the economic slowdown coupled with rising interest rates globally and a, and a dearth of uh, kind of asset uh, capital inflows means that there's going to be a lot of issues with a number of debt markets around the world, particularly kind of emerging sovereign debt. Just to give you guys a sense, global debt is about $235 trillion in public and private. Um, you know, that's somewhere between $5 and $15 trillion of interest payments a year, depending on what the net rate is on $96 trillion global GDP. And there's another trillion and a half of unfunded liabilities in the U.S. and pensions and Social Security and all this other stuff. I think this is the year where a lot of the debt markets start to unravel. The, the, um, the entity that steps in to try and support these um, unwinding moments is the IMF. And I think that no matter what the IMF does, they're going to look bad. I think that, the, you know, it's sort of like like Jerome Powell this, this past year, right? Like you, you raised rates too late, you raised rates too quickly. No matter what you do, it has some adverse effect and impact. It's either inflationary uh, or it impacts growth. And so I think the IMF uh, is going to get a lot of heat for either acting not too soon uh, or sorry, not fast enough or uh, or acting too aggressively and causing inflation. Uh, as a bunch of these markets face credit risk uh, this year. So my big bet is the IMF is going to play a major role, and we're going to be talking a lot about the IMF later this year. I, I think as a result, the IMF will get a lot of heat, and you'll end up seeing a lot of pressure and political, you know, just like we blame NATO, just like we blame uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed, we'll end up blaming the IMF for a bunch of problems uh, that'll arise. But the natural physics of what's going on is the world has too much debt and not enough growth to cover the debt, the cost of debt. That's it. Okay. Um, as you guys know, there's been a big shift in capital allocation. A lot of the folks who were writing big checks into growth rounds are retreating back to writing smaller checks in seed and A rounds. They don't want to write the $20 million Series B. They want to write the $5 million seed and A round. Uh, no one wants to kind of follow the valuation. No one wants to set the valuation for these growth businesses, particularly if after this round, you know you need another big round of capital and no one's sure if someone's going to be waiting on the other end. As a result, we're seeing tons of these businesses run into capital infusion walls. They can't pivot. I think we'll see what we saw in the dot-com bubble where 99.5% of these companies actually die. The half percent that win are going to emerge as the next $100 billion enterprises, the Googles and the Amazons of the world. So there will be light at the end of the tunnel for the winners. But generally, there are hundreds of companies in hardware, in SynBio, in biotech, in high growth enterprise uh, software that require significant sales investment expense. A lot of these businesses where the capital intensive nature of the business just doesn't have the market for it right now. 
Uh, and- my, my biggest loser for business in 23 is the consumer. Mm. I just don't understand how the consumer isn't going to finally tap out in this economy. I mean, they, they have a mountain of personal debt, credit card debts at all-time highs. I think the average credit card rate hit 19.6% last week and is expected to yeah. rise even further. Uh, the mortgage rates are above 7% now, so forget about trying to buy a new home or uh, sell your home, and your stock portfolio is down too, and now layoffs are starting to pile up. So mm. I just don't understand how we're going to avoid a recession. And you saw you know, Kashkari saying that ra- the Fed's going to keep raising 5.4% his prediction. Uh, you know, I don't understand how if, if rates are at 5.5%, that doesn't finally break the back of this economy. And uh, we go into a recession.